Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Marzia Lanfranchi, and I'm the Intelligence Director at Transformers Foundation, as well as the founder of Cotton Diaries. And Transformers Foundation is a unified voice representing the denim industry and its ideas for positive change. And Cotton Diaries is a global community of, passionate, of people passionate about making cotton systems more sustainable. And I want to thank you, everybody, for being here because um, into this um, OECD forum side session. And um, today we will learn from a panel of top experts and how to tackle fashion's misinformation issue, the role of fact checking, and how responsible data use relates to due diligence. And I want to give an extra minute or, okay, great. We're all here. So let's start by welcoming our top experts. As a, and I want to start by introducing each one of you, but I'll let you introduce yourself. So Alison, I want to start from you. Uh, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Alison Jager. I'm the independent fact checker on this project and a communication specialist. Thank you, Alison. And Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Klein. Um, I wear a few different hats. I am an author and a journalist. Um, I was honored and had the delight to work as, um, uh, alongside Marzia and Transformers Foundation as the co-author on this report. And then I'm also the director of advocacy and policy at Remake, an NGO uh, driving change in the fashion industry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Simon. Yeah, so I'm Simon Perigno. I'm a, a writer and researcher on cotton and sustainability. I've uh, been working over 20 years in this area. Um, yeah. Thank you, Simon. I'm so honored to have you all. And uh, Annie, if you can share the screen again. Uh, thank you. So last year, we, I don't know, probably many of you here have read this report, many haven't. But last year, I had the honor to work with all of these experts, um, with Simon, Elizabeth, and Alison on this paper, which is Cotton, a case study in misinformation. And this paper covers um, the fashion industry misinformation issue and uses Cotton claims as our case study. And uh, if you haven't read it yet, I would encourage you to do so. And probably Annie can share the link in our chat box to download it. And our hope for this work was basically to create a resource that helps the fashion industry strengthen its critical data consumption skills, such as how to fact check claims, locate primary sources, and understand and be critical of the role that data and statistics have in society. And uh, basically it was our aim was to slow and re reverse this major issue. And that's why we're here today. Next slide, please. Um, but before we start, I want to go around and ask you all, um, on a scale of one, from one to 100, how much of a threat to society is the use of inaccurate data and why? You have one minute each. And I want to start with uh, Simon. So it's, it's a massive threat because if we don't start from correct information, then we are not resolving problems in the right order to the right scale. Um, yeah, and whether, it, whether we're talking about pesticides or water or soils, we have to first know what the problem is, how important it is, and then use the information we find to look for the solutions that are relevant, applicable, and doable in each case. And they're going to be different in each case because there's no single cotton system out there. There's thousands of cotton systems. Yeah, yeah. Elizabeth, over to you. So I'm gonna resist the urge to put a number on it out of, um, you know, honoring the spirit of our paper. 
I, I would say that um, the use of inaccurate data itself is really just a symptom of a wider misinformation system that has infected every corner of society. It's not just fashion. Uh, data is the weapon of choice in this misinformation system precisely because data has so much power. People have this perception, myself included, especially prior to working on this project, that numbers don't lie, that they're indisputable, that they're somehow always closer to the truth than words. And while data is and can be an incredibly useful tool to capture a deeper reality, numbers are also very easy to transpose, misinterpret, take out of context, and use to mislead. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Alison, I want to ask you from a fact checker communication specialist point of view. Um, uh, misinformation is often also an issue of the proliferation of misinformation. What we found is that once a false idea is out there, it's extremely challenging to combat. In the course of uh, working on this paper, we spent a lot of time distilling figures from Pew surveys about how people's ideas change once they're confronted with a new reputable set of data or a deeper context. And what we found is that people's opinions don't, don't change. And so the real challenge is that you have to, from the start, present information that is accurate. Otherwise, you will uh, be confronted with many uh, challenges in getting the opinion change, which is why fact checking from the initial place is such a value too. Yeah, thank you. And Elizabeth, I want to put you on this spot again, just before we, we get into our uh, unpacking uh, our work. You know, sometimes, people think that a single stat, a shocking stat used in fashion is not as important as the rest of the misinformation, you know, at societal level. But, you know, we've learned through our report that th these are interlinked. Can you comment more on that? Because I think that was a massive realization for both of us. Right. I mean, I think for anyone who works in the fashion space, like this industry is is denigrated in many different ways, but we certainly underplay. Um, uh, and I mean that in the sense of look, look down on and not taken seriously. Um, and uh, we've certainly seen that people, this was my perception at the start of the report, which was that um, uh, misinformation in fashion was just our little dirty secret, but actually it is connected to these wider misinf misinformation systems that are impacting um, everything in society. So um, certainly it's leading to political polarization. Um, it's leading to mistrust around uh, big global issues that we need to solve um, like climate change. Uh, so that is one of the things that we really wanted to establish with the report is to show how you know, this seemingly harmless um, uh, instinct to share a shocking statistic about how much cotton water uh, consumes is connected to these bigger societal issues. Yeah, absolutely. So let's look at these um, one big statistic that we worked on. Um, so cotton consumes 20,000 liters of water per kilogram of fiber. And so today we, we want to spend the next 40 minutes unpacking these specific shocking statistic that is associated with cotton. And it seems to many probably um, not as, um, as threatening to society, but we're gonna unpack why this is problematic and if it actually is true. So next slide, please. So what, what we want to do today, and I'm going to ask Alison and Elizabeth to help me go through this fact-checking exercise to understand whether it's true or not, um, this statistic used across many, many mm, media and actually even reports. So, but before I start, I, um, I want to introduce everybody to the concept of fact-checking. And Alison, who better than Alison to do that? So Alison, what is fact-checking and how does it work? 
In its most simplistic form, fact checking is the independent verification of reported facts, statements, or data. The level of detail that is confirmed in this process can be uh, as seemingly nominal as the correct spelling of a name or as nuanced and complex as determining if an argument is based on sound and accurate characterizations of primary source information. The practice is rooted in journalistic principles that were hammered out around the turn of the century when newsrooms sought to eradicate yellow journalism journalism and mock breaking and earn the trust of readers. Initially, back checking departments was under the purview of magazines, but today it's spread across all fields from publishing to newspapers, books, trade, uh, consulting firms, government. The highest caliber of fact checking in terms of the most laborious uh, process today is still done in magazines where there's an entire department uh, who have usually gone, undergone uh, a duration of training before taking on this as a professional endeavor. And that's my background. Uh, today, we generally hear about fact checking in the context of reviewing a politician's speech or a monologue during a, a debate or fact checking after uh, a political speech. Um, but uh, organizations across fields do uh, work with fact checkers. Thank you so much, Alison, for the introduction. Um, so um, next slide, please. So where have we found these shocking statistic? Uh, Elizabeth and Alison, both, it's a question for you both. Sure. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to convey in the paper is that misinformation really operates in an ecosystem. So we noticed when we were doing press for the paper that there was this strong urge to find a single person to blame, who, you know, who is responsible. And when we started really looking just into this claim, you know, we found that it's been shared by credible NGOs, international institutions, governments, um, yes, of course, it's shared on social media and blogs, but it's also um, shared by uh, credible media outlets. So in a way, everyone has um, participated in this problem at some point. And, you know, just, just to highlight some of the ways that it's used, brands use it to do things to bolster claims like they're moving towards 100% sustainable cotton. So it's used to create the sense of a false benchmark from which they can move away from. And we also use, uh, see brands use it a lot to problem shift. So to hawk a different product or material. So to encourage people to switch to hemp or recycled polyester, for example, which doesn't actually solve the underlying problem of uh, water in, in, in the cotton industry. Alison, did you want to add anything on that or? Yeah. Um, this particular figure of 20,000 liters of water uh, per kilogram of cotton and many other that are sort of the punchy, if you've heard of them, the more kind of ubiquitous uh, numbers out there, are, are out there around cotton. Um, we have seen used in government reports, we've seen them used in newspapers, and we've seen them used in ways where they're also footnoted and cited. And so it is deceptive that it's a reliable source. It's not as though this number is just out there and you're seeing it in the body text of something from a reputable organization. We're actually seeing it footnoted and then going to that original source footnoted again. So um, it does create a challenge even for a close reader. Right. And so what we, what we did um, with Elizabeth and Alison and myself, and also Simon, actually, we were all involved. We tried to find the primary source for these as a first step, right? As you would do um, through a fact checking. Um, so Alison, can you talk us through it? Um, next slide, please, I think that's, yeah. Uh, what we believe is probably the uh, original source where the 20,000 number was extracted from comes from a 1999 World Wildlife Fund report where there's a table that you see with uh, cotton lint circled at the bottom. So that table has a couple of cited sources. So we went through them. One is a German book published in 1996, The Cultural Plants of the Tropics and Subtropics. Um, while a book is 
you know, often undergoes fact checking. When we went through it, we couldn't find that as the original source. The second uh, is a book of crop production and field experimentation from a reputable professor in India. And this book focused on local numbers. We couldn't find anything about, pertaining to global data. The third source that was cited uh, within that table that looked rather promising came from a publication by the OECD. Although when we went to that original table, as you'll see, there's no there's no line item for cotton. It's not included at all. Uh, so then we went ahead and did a little extra due diligence and went to the Agricultural Outlook Fact Book from OECD and checked out all of the inputs. Is water consumption included? And we found it's not. There's a lot of other data that we've used about total land cultivation area that really matched up other numbers that we've seen. Um, and, uh, but we, we couldn't locate this original source. Uh, mm -hmm. Once more, the range was 7,000 to 29,000, and what we're often seeing later on is 20,000, and we weren't able to to find any anything further. Mm -hmm. So that you know that report was from 1999, and even we've concluded that even there, it didn't have any credible data that that figure was coming from. But so Elizabeth. What, what happened here? It's such a good question because what's so interesting about this particular data point is that, you know, what gets shared is usually that cotton consumes 20,000 liters of water per kilogram of land. Sometimes we see it as 10,000 liters um, per kilogram of land. But then when we went back and tried to find a primary source, we just couldn't find one that ever said that, that particular span. Um, so how did it become 20,000 liters? Um, so one of the things that we did in the report is tried to come up with a uh, kind of a, a rubric of understanding how misinformation spreads, because here we did our um, due diligence in terms of trying to figure out where it originates. But as I was saying earlier, we all kind of end up playing a role in perpetuating it um, because once a number is out there, it often um, or it has a tendency to degrade in quality over time, especially, of course, in 1999, people are not using the internet and social media as much as we do now. So what we found is that um, we identified five main ways that misinformation spread and of, spreads. And of course, this isn't comprehensive, but I think it's useful. One is oversimplification. With data, we really see people pulling towards uh, wanting a, a clean, you know, simple, perfect number. 20,000 liters, it sounds shocking, it's neat. So maybe, maybe people were simply wanting to oversimplify the idea. The other thing we see with data is erratic copying. So numbers get changed and transposed over time. And then people make a copy of a copy of a copy. And um, uh, the, the number ends up moving further and further away from the truth. And I think that this number is in particular a victim of what we call mythic proportions. We've seen it so many times at this point and in so many sources that we just believe it must be true because you know, how could you confront a fact for that long that is in fact false? Um, and one of the things we're gonna be talking about later, um, later in the presentation is that actually when you confront data over and over and over again, that's a, that's a good, uh, indicator that you need to start asking questions because especially in an industry like cotton, data is gonna be constantly changing. It's not gonna be static. Yeah. And I think I wanna add on to that. The, most of the links that linked to these supposedly primary source linked to a screenshot, no, to um, a, um, sorry, an infographic from WWF on their site that cited exactly this, this number. And this was a number that was, a, was an infographic that was taken down in 2020, but had been there from 2013. So a very, very long time. And um, yeah, on that, I, on that note, I would like to um, introduce you to our framework. So what did we do with this data? We tried to um, process it in a way that was, uh, was rated from red to gold. 
And uh, this is a framework that was inspired by the New Standard Institute, but where red is information that is not at all reliable, where you have no known primary source, you have unverified um, data that is based or based on obsolete data. And the gold standard is peer reviewed articles that are transparent about funding and autos affiliations. Um, next slide, please. So what do we rated this uh, claim? Uh, well, red, as, uh, as we discussed, there was no known primary source. It was missing key context and it is inaccurate in a modern context and should not be used. But um, what is the real, what are the real numbers actually? So we went to try and find out uh, um, a credible source to have a good number in place of, uh, of that statistic. And uh, we turned into to the International Cotton Advisory Committee, uh, which worked with us to have, um, to have the most up-to-date data. And uh, whilst there is not a combined figures for um, all the water use, so the green water, which is rainwater, ray water, which is um, often um, referred to as, um, I mean, I don't want to get into the technical terminologies, but to, um, uh, to pollution water and then uh, uh, blue water, which is uh, um, irrigation water. So the numbers uh, uh, as of 2020 is that cotton uses 1,931 liters of irrigation water, so blue water on average, to produce a kilogram of lint, and 6,003 liters of rainwater, so green water, to produce one kilogram of lint. The gray water is, um, is very, um, it's a figure that we couldn't find. So just to prove that, um, that 20,000 mm, liters of uh, statistic is very far from even the combination of this number. But here on the screen, you can see um, just on the blue water, so the irrigation water, you can see the differences between the countries. And what, we've, what we found is just a global average that varies so much from all the 75 different countries that grow cotton. And um, just on that note, um, I want to play a little video to show how these global averages and these global shocking statistics are still used by uh, the mainstream media. Um, let's watch it. Sound is not working. Uh oh, sorry for the technical issue. Maybe I can do the voiceover, but I don't think I can. <laughs> um, and it, oh, there you go. Human cost, but the environmental cost. Yeah, I wasn't informed at all. How are you? I'm Stacey, nice to see you. Thank you. Um, can we borrow you for five minutes? Yeah. What have you been buying? My mum bought this. She bought a jacket. So show me what you've got in your bag. Ah, so a hoodie? Yeah. And is it cotton? Yep. This is 100% cotton. Brilliant. Interesting. So how much water, Johnny, do you think has gone in to growing the cotton necessary to make this jacket? Probably about 800. 800? Yeah. Seven liters, 20, 30 liters. 20 or 30 liters. Yeah. Growing the cotton yeah. to make that jacket yeah. will have taken 10,330 liters of water. 4,580 liters of water. 10,800 liters of water just to grow the cotton to make that jacket. I can't believe you. Sorry, that's such a warm lovely. Oh my god. It's 13 years for one person. Which is goodness. Ridiculous, shirt. right? 24 years of drinking water for one person. 24 years. 
That's wild, right? That's wild. It's crazy. That shocks you? It does shock me, yeah. How, how does that make you feel? You look visibly shocked. Yeah. 25 years of drinking water for one person. Oh, wow. And that's for two items. Oh, I'm a horrible person. <laughs> Do you really need that jacket as much as someone needs 10,000 litres of water? No. I'm sorry to get upset, but it's... Yeah. <laughs> Tell me why you're so yeah, because, emotional about that fact. Yeah, because I know people they are struggling to get water for, 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 for drink or to wash or to cook. And we are using for making this. It makes me feel bad here. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to go return it. Does it make you think that you might shop differently or you might give Oh, yes. From today, I learned something. I think I'm going to change my way I shop. Really? Oh, yes. You really mean that? It's very yeah, easy I to mean say. It. I swear. I mean it. <laughs> oh, my God. I do truly believe that it's not that people don't care. We're just not informed. I'm absolutely the worst because I'm a nightmare. I shop all the time. And so I don't think we know enough. And I think it's about just trying at least to shop responsibly. Okay. Shocking, right? Um, Simon, I want to bring you in on this one. Um, why do you think this narrative um, is so problematic and this data use is so problematic? Oh, I can't hear you. You're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I'm muted because I have a seven-year-old in the house. So. Um, yeah, it's it's problematic because it's it's it sets out to use a high figure to shock people, and while the intent is good, which is to get people to think about their consumption, it's bad because it's demonising cotton. So rather than address the fact that cotton is complex, that as you showed earlier, the the amount of water that can be used on cotton can vary dramatically, but it also neglects to talk about the fact that. <clears throat> a low level of water can be more problematic than a high one because it depends on the availability of water in a given region. Um, so it, it completely fails to talk about that. And of course, it completely fails to talk about the fact that many farmers depend on cotton to make good livelihoods uh, and they often don't have any other crop options. So there, there's a whole range of complexities that are put out. And even more damaging, of course, is that that was put out on a you know, a major global media corporation. So we'll have reached millions of people probably, um, leading to people to perhaps make a worse sustainability decision because they didn't think, they thought next time they saw cotton, they thought, my God, that's terrible, too much water. And they may have thought something worse unknowingly because, because they're, not, they're not well informed. And it will also have led brands to make investment decisions. So they will have looked at that and thought, We've got to reduce the amount of cotton in our next collection because this has gone out. Um, so, you know, there's a knock on effect as well. So. Yeah. And Elizabeth, uh, I'm sure you want to add something to this. Um, I think that one of the things that, and I think Simon is going to talk more about this, um, is this is an example of what we call in the report irresponsible framing. So one of the, the main takeaways in that segment is um, that by buying a cotton garment, you are um, denying someone access to drinking water. Um, and uh, you know, unpacking that a little bit, that kind of pointed us in the direction of like, okay, well, our reader doesn't understand, for example, the, the global, how the water cycle works, you know, can you actually use up water in um, uh, the, the global water cycle? And you, you can't really. So um, one of the things we did in the report was really explain to people um, the complexity of water um, and point out that yes, like water scarcity, um, access to water is hugely important, but it's also very complex. And I'll also just reiterate what Simon said, which is that global averages in, um, I would say any agricultural system are very misleading and um, definitely in the cotton industry. I don't know if we've said this before, but cotton is grown in 
um, I believe 75 different countries by 20 million farmers. So the just the range of ecosystems, climates, uh, styles of farming um, vary so dramatically that when you get to this point where you collapse it down to this one shocking statistic, um, it's, it's very damaging. Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. And on that note, um, the reason why we're here today and we're part of the OECD um, side session is to discuss how this misinformation issue relates to due diligence. And so, Simon, what if we were to apply, instead of using these global average statistics and this shocking number, actually a due diligence approach? Um, next slide, please. Simon, uh, let's talk us through what, what would you do instead? You would essentially look at your own supply chain. So that this is what due diligence is. It, it's looking at who supplies you, following through all the different avenues. Think of it like a river with tributaries, inflows, and so on. You've got to identify every single element in there identify the problems and then look at what you can do to either solve them or mitigate them or, or, or do anything so you're no longer looking at somebody else's averages have we seen they can be out of date or they can just be plain wrong uh, they can be something that somebody's done for a completely different region that you decide you're just going to put in your um, in your reports because that's the only information you can find just plain old data um, or it can be some an LCA that's out of date because an LCA is only ever a, a snapshot in time. And you're gonna use real world information. You're gonna go out, you're gonna talk, you're gonna find out which farmers are supplying the gins from which you get your cotton, which goes into your spinning mills. And you're gonna to talk to those farmers and say, what's the problem? Is there a problem? How can we deal with it? Next slide. So in Southern Africa, this is a, an exercise I did a few years ago before there was actually guidance for um, garments and footwear, but where a retailer asked me to just say, go and look there and see, is water causing a problem? Is our, is our use of cotton from this region causing a problem? And is there anything we can do, do about it? That's a, that is a due diligence question. Is there a problem? So next slide. Um, and what, what was happening at that point, there was a, a pro program, somebody had decided water's a big problem, so let's dig some wells. Uh, there was uncertainty whether cotton benefited or hindered food production. Uh, and the reality we found was that many villages actually were totally unsuitable for, for digging a well to get drinking water because the water was saline. This was an old seafloor, so, you know, about 50% of the time, if you dug a well, what you'd get back was salt water. And the other thing we found was that cotton brings cash um, and the food problems, they relate to the lack of water available for growing food. <clears throat> and we identified ways to solve that. So what we found was that there was opportunities. Farmers said, you know, if you can help us um, with the technology, We'll make bricks, we can line storage wells, we can build check dams, we can capture some of that water so that once we've grown cotton, we can then grow vegetables where it's very hard to do both in parallel. And there was other opportunities uh, emerging as well to collect rainwater for household use. Next slide. Um, so th this is it, this is real world data says this is what we can do about something. Move on now. Thank you so much. And yeah. uh, I mean, this is uh, just because of the sake of time, we have a, uh, we don't have so much time to discuss it, but I'm sure that some of the question um, can, uh, oh yeah, I forgot actually. I seen some of you putting uh, uh, questions in the Q and A box and we will address them at the end. Uh, but before we finish, I want to, um, I want to just, with all of you, explore some of the solutions to, um, you know, to reverse this misinformation issue and actually to go deeper into the nuances and actual realities of cotton. So how do you actually, in your everyday work, uh, filter misleading versus credible claims? And this is a question to all. And I want to start with you, Alison. 
uh, when I'm looking at data, I'm always trying to find the primary source, the original body or entity that gathered that data, um, rather than relying on the secondary source. So someone who's published a version of that or the tertiary, someone who's published something off of something, off of something. Um, and when I'm looking at a study about resource consumption, I'm trying to identify what are the variables around it? What's the context? What's the scope? And then I'm looking if there's a lot of times we're seeing comparative data between cotton and hemp or cotton and poly uh, or different synthetic polymers. And I'm looking to see if it's something where it's a natural fiber. Are we using global ad, uh, averages or are we using local? What I see often is that because there is a paucity of publicly available LCAs, you'll have a global average versus something in lab conditions or a global average versus something in national conditions that just happens to be available but is not necessarily uh, paradigmatic of anything beyond that specific local region. So I'm always assuming something is false <laughs> and, uh, and uh, trying to unpack it. Oh, thanks, Alison. And Elizabeth, what, um, what do you do in your everyday work to filter misleading from credible claims? Sure. So I'm going to talk about it on two levels. The first is that <clears throat> some of the, the takeaways from the report that I wanted to convey, um, you know, Alison mentioned um, assuming that a claim is false, starting from that premise. But I also want to let people know that being skeptical of data is not the same thing as being cynical. Um, we are really asking you to just do your due diligence, do your homework. Um, I also, um, and Marzia, you might want to add to this, we are committing to this process with this report. We are going to update it this year. So we're going to be um, really tre treating it as a dynamic um, uh, report um, and making sure that anything that needed to be uh, corrected from the last report is changed. And then of course, updating it with the most recent information. Um, the other thing that I would recommend people to do is always ask how people arrive at statistics. It's okay to ask us how we arrived at the numbers that we used in our report. In fact, that's a really important part of the process. Um, do I have time to talk about it on an NGO level? I'm just gonna, real quick. Okay, so at Remake, um, the, the nonprofit that I, I work at, here, is, here are the, some of the processes, processes and standards that we've put in place since the report came out. Um, we started with what I would call low-hanging fruit. So we have this internal fact sheet, data sheet about fashion's impacts that everybody pulls from. So we're going to go through and update that and do it on an annual basis. Again, acknowledging that data can quickly become out of date. Um, and be misinfor misinformation. We were reassigning older stories and content um, and making sure that they're updated. And one thing I learned in this process that was so interesting to me is that our content that has a lot of data is the most widely read. So that really underscores how powerful numbers are and why it's so important for all of us to commit to being uh, responsible consumers of data. Um, and then uh, the last thing is that we're uh, developing internal data guidelines for our freelance writers. And the good thing about this is you don't have to do this work yourself. Those guidelines are already out there. The BBC, for example, has um, fabulous uh, guidelines for journalists and organizations that you can just uh, pull from on, um, on the internet. They have their, their whole uh, uh, st approach to statistics up on, online. Yeah, sadly they didn't apply it to the uh, video that we shown. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I, yeah. I, want to, I wanted to add on this that uh, this is the type of, um, you know, talking to one another, doing this work together. It's the type of thing that really worked um, to our advantage. Like talking from, uh, you know, not from pointing fingers, but to actually create a collaborative approach to higher the bar on, on data that is spread uh, on the internet about fashion's impact. I think it's super key. And, uh, and yeah, thanks also Elizabeth to opening this discussion about the NGO space. And, um, um, but Simon, over to you, because I, we talked amid a mix of 
how do you actually filter misleading versus credible claim, but actually also what you've done um, you know, concretely to, to tackle these issues. So I don't know if you want to add any uh, anything on the points that Alison and Elizabeth had. Uh, yeah, just maybe do a, a slight diversion because I think the main point's been covered by Eliz Elizabeth and Alison, but the, the importance of accurate data is also that it opens doors. So going back a, a number of years when we were first starting as NGOs and campaigners at that point, talking to the International Cotton Advisory Committee, uh, a challenge that came back from them was some of your numbers are out of date. Um, would you care to update them? Um, which we duly did, I think a, a lot of us. And that meant that we were suddenly able to talk to a section of the industry that at that point we were not able to, they were not interested in uh, much in campaigners, they're mostly interested in how they could debunk what we had to say, but actually going and looking for the up-to-date information on pesticide poisonings in particular meant that they had to, we were then talking to them with up-to-date and accurate figures, which were uncontestable. And that meant we've had dialogue with sections of the industry that we didn't have before. And I think the industry now is in a much better place for it. Nowhere near out of the woods, but much improved. Yeah. Simon, I think you touched on a very good point. And it's a point of trust, which it's been eroded in this industry amongst players by either pointing fingers or also you know, these, this issue of using outdated statistics, it creates, you know, I, I don't want to feel that a, a, an organization is not credible because it shared once uh, a statistic that was out of date or was misleading. I think it's, um, hmm, yeah, I think it's a problem of trust here and we're, we, we need to reestablish that trust between all players and all stakeholders. Um, I want to actually go to the questions because we have very interesting questions here. Um, and uh, some of them are pretty similar. So, but um, let's, uh, let's go with the first one that we have from Nancy Rhodes. So can you talk, um, Elizabeth, it's, this is for you. Can you talk about the five ways that misinformation spreads? Because we, she, she said she's only, heard about um, oversimplification. Sure, and I'm gonna read from the report. Uh, we have a, a, a really nifty graphic explaining this on, on page 46. So the five are, um, I already went over this, but oversimplification. So that's reducing information and removing important context uh, for the sake of ease of understanding, and then you you tip into into misinformation. Um, there are all sorts of ways that this happens, but one of the things we encourage people to do is that even when you're using data, use it with all of the caveats and disclaimers that that really that that number really deserves to have attached to it. And the second is what we call mythic proportions. So that is when a claim is used for so long and by so many uh, organizations, it gives it a false sense of legitimacy. And as Allison mentioned at the top of the, this presentation, um, ideas also, this is just a tick of human psychology. Once we're exposed to misinformation, it's very difficult to replace it with credible uh, misinformation. Um, the third is irresponsible framing. So when key context is removed or data is selectively edited to frame information for the benefit of the sharer. So I think the BBC documentary, um, I, I, I feel bad that we're picking, there's just so many examples of this, but it's, it is a good example where, you know, the 20,000 liters number is shocking and it really serves um, the purpose of getting viewers um, and uh, attention on your project. Uh, the fourth is erratic copying. So what tends to happen um, is that information is copied when it gets copied multiple times, which is what is happening every day on the internet, both in uh, media, by the media and social media. It loses its original source and it degrades in quality and becomes less accurate over time. That's why it's really important to go back and find and verify that original source. Um, and then the fifth, is the credibility trap, which was one of the most interesting to me, which is this, this idea that if the BBC said it, if the New York Times said it, 
there's no way it can be, you know, it could be inaccurate. So I'm just going to copy and paste it onto my Instagram, um, Instagram account. So, uh, you know, we've seen these claims shared by, by virtually every institution you can think of in society. So we do, we do really have to, to stop and acknowledge that this is a serious problem that has infected a lot of different institutions and do, again, be skeptical, not cynical, and do, do your homework. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. And um, a lot of you, I can see there's a, there's a uh, heat around the, the HIG index the, um, and other platforms that use these global averages. And uh, a question from Ken goes, I wonder how your learnings findings compare to how the HIG system breaks cotton. And uh, Heinz, uh, is saying, what do you think about the HIG MSI using global average data for organic, but also for conventional cotton and textile exchange, the global fashion agenda and many other used data. And looks like the policy hub wants to have an EU PEF using HIG MSI. Okay, very long, but I'm, I'm sure that Simon got the question. Um, I think you would be probably <laughs> wanting to comment on this? Um, yeah, I think it, it's a huge mistake to be using averages for these systems because, um, again, it's not just that it, the information is inaccurate, but you're potentially going to be causing huge harm to cotton farming communities um, by doing so. And you're potentially going to be, uh, if you just purely say that, you know, any as an example, anything less than 10,000 litres is classed as sustainable. Well, it's not going to be because there's some regions where 10,000 litres of water is a cost because there just isn't enough water to supply that. And in other areas, you may well be able to use 20,000 litres because there's a source of water that nobody else is, is using that otherwise just flows, flows away. Um, so no, the I don't understand why <clears throat> averages are being used when we have the, the data systems to handle very complex systems. Um, we have artificial intelligence, we have so many tools at our disposal that could allow us to analyze sources. Um, and, you know, if the EU, for example, is serious about due diligence legislation, then all of its imports should be judged on real world data. If you're going to be asking companies to trace their supply chains, by law, then you should be asking them to provide real world, up to date, accurate information and not benchmark against averages that are meaningless. Um, so, you know, I have a very strong um, opinion on that, as you can <laughs> tell. Um, <clears throat> and I, yeah, have I missed anything, Marzia, or is there more to no. ask on that? Yeah. It's important to add uh, on this uh, comparison of conventional and organic. We've touched upon it in our paper. I would recommend uh, uh, on that question, go deep into the paper. I don't think we have the time to unpack that myth as well, that um, cotton saves 91% uh, water compared to conventional. It was a comparison. Organic of cotton, that organic yeah. cotton, so yeah. Um, <laughs> and, um, but yeah, I, I want to get to this question by Anu. How should we train students to work on this issue. And maybe Alison, do you wanna take that one? If you have ideas, Elizabeth, um, yeah. Sure, um, I, I think that it's really great to do something like the fact-checking exercise that we've done. You know, take a, a, a number or statistic that you've seen out there that you're not really sure where it came from and play around with it. Go to the footnotes, um, look up the original sources, track down uh, the books from, you know, some when we are dealing with uh, this level of data, the books that we're finding that for like old numbers and we can't find the sources, the books are, are from like the 80s or 90s and it gets a little complicated to track them down, but we do that. Um, so, so have an exercise like that so there can be a little 
little bit of an experience. Um, and then you'll start to begin to see trends, uh, those five ways misinformation spreads. I mean, this is something that we, we have observed these trends. It's not just that it's in the report, but we've all seen erratic company copying. I, I know for myself, the most common type of error that I will find in data is that numbers have been transposed and then reproduced. It just, it just happens with everyone unless you uh, have a kind of dedicated team to look for these errors. Thanks, Alison. And uh, Elizabeth, I see that you want to, to answer live this question. So when does old data become outdated if there is no updated recent data available, particularly SMEs rely on publicly available data and do not have the resources to do the research? Such a good question. And I definitely want to hear from my fellow panelists on this. So in the report, um, we um, so old data becomes misinformation when subsequent events that have happened since it came out make that information false. So in the case of the cotton industry, our recommendation was that um, uh, people should be using data that is uh, no more, really ideally no more than five years old. And if you're using decade, uh, excuse me, data that's a decade old, use it with a caveat. So, you know, say this is the latest available data. That's the other thing is that if you're using, um, you're using data, and I said this earlier, um, add those caveats and disclaimers, say, you know, this, this is the latest available data we can find. Um, uh, but I, I guess the question that I would want to ask um, for the other panelists is like, is this uh, length of time we've established for the cotton industry, like how, how relevant would that be if someone's looking at a statistic about polyester, for example, or other materials? Um, and the other thing that I want to say is if you're looking for data about cotton and water, the point of this report is to give people that free resource. So at least for a large part of you know, the, the value chain, we've done the work for you. And we really hope other um, organizations uh, take this approach and apply it to other aspects of fashion because we agree with you that we need more publicly available data and um, we're just in this frustrating place right now where um, we don't have it, yeah. And just uh, before we go, maybe I um, your question was probably for Simon and, and, and Alison, but I want to point out that one suggestion from my side is that before using data, first ask yourself why you're using it and what change are you hoping to drive with that use? Because if you're using just a shocking statistic to attract attention on your website, maybe you want to rethink twice what you're doing. And if you're using data to inform your sustainability decision, then it's a different approach. So it really depends on how, how you're going to use it. And also, as Elizabeth mentioned before, to compare, um, and Alison too, to compare from, from a fiber to another, maybe you want to really take this seriously. Um, but um, Simon, if you want to comment on what Elizabeth just uh, just asked uh, on the, um, sorry, Elizabeth, do you want to rephrase? Yeah, I mean, my question is, you know, what we've been talking about is that agriculture is this dynamic, constantly changing system. So that's why we gave this five to 10 years, you know, try to use really the most recent data. And that's also why we're committing to updating the report this year. So people have access to fresh data. Um, but, it, you know, does that recommendation change for a different material? Um, I really don't think it does because it's um, things are changing and I think you know particularly with the problem raised in the question about you know for the problem for SMEs then I think you know yes it's hard to do your own research maybe understaffed but send an email to, to people I you know I get lots of them and I try and answer um, and with SMEs yeah it's it's generally it's no charge <laughs> it, it's um, because it, it is hard so you know the fact that people reach out is is valued and i think you know so look at um the other thing to try and do if you're just doing a quick bit of online searching then never rely on a single source so even on your first google page it's true nobody goes to the second page 
you should get two or three results. And if there's a big difference, that's when you, you're going to want to dig deeper. So mm -hmm. just look for discrepancies that make you think, hmm, why is there so much debate or dispute? That tells you there's something wrong with the data somewhere and that you need, you need to dig a bit more. So again, that's part of due diligence is learning when to ask a, a more detailed question. Other thing you can do, you know, is subscribe to a, a journal or a magazine that has a lot of information. Um, well, we, you know, I don't want to plug any particular one, but there's a, there's, there's a couple of them out there um, because that would also provide you hopefully with information or with the names of people that you might want to, to ask. Two of the resources that we provided in the report um, that I want to draw attention to building off what Simon is saying is um, other credible uh, sources that we recommend. So other resources that you can look to when you're um, communicating about cotton and water. And then the other thing is that there's a lot of localized data in the report. So, um, you know, and, and Simon, step in if you think that this is bad advice, but, you know, if you know that you are, um, you, you know, where you're sourcing your cotton, there's a lot of country level data about cotton and water. So one of the things that we are recommending is that people um, move towards this due diligence approach of describing your own your own supply chain. But I think at the very least, um, we could start by describing the actual specific place um, where the cotton is being sourced. Because as we sh you know showed at the top of the presentation, if you're sourcing your cotton from uh, you know a country in West Africa where it's entirely rain fed, that's a very different um, scenario that if than if you're um, sourcing from a, a very arid country that's like only using irrigation and like large volumes of irrigation. We are just towards the end and I'm sorry if I didn't get through the questions. Um, I think we can collect them and, and answer them via email but uh, and, and or comment on social media. Let's We'll figure out a way, but uh, I want to ask just, uh, I want to get the chance to ask the last question to all of you. So what is the one call to action for the audience today that we want to, that you want to get across to tackle misinformation in the fashion industry? Um, I want to start with you, Alison. Sure. Uh, I'll give a more fact checker answer, which is um, when you're conducting your research and you're trying to look at environmental impacts, whether it's water or it's carbon, and you're looking at materials, avoid these global averages, look for the most uh, localized level data that is available to you, and do not cross uh, global averages in a comparison with localized. You'll end up with very unuseful uh, information. Thank you, Alison. And uh, Simon? Yeah, I would say, yeah, check your data. I think the, the comment about transposing zeros, I mean, for those who've been reading the stories about the um, certification problems again in India, I can testify from years ago, that is one of the major, major problems in the reporting of organic cotton figures. And people then tend to accept things at face value because it comes from what looks like an official source. Uh, and also because there's a benefit in it. So there's a question unanswered there about um, why do people do it? And often it's for market benefit. Always be wary of that. So the best, you know, my call to action for people is know your supply chain as far as possible. Yeah, Thank that's that's your best protection against misinformation. Thank you, Simon. Elizabeth? I'm going to say what I've said a few times already, which is be skeptical, but not cynical of data. Um, do your due diligence. And then um, my main call to action is to not use data to problem shift. Um, a due diligence approach to using data would be using data in the context in which it was produced in order to produce, uh, improve conditions and make uh, progress. What we see people doing is using data to um, ask consumers to switch to a different material um, in order to gain market share. And um, there's a comment in the chat, we really should be using data um, in order to improve conditions on, on the ground. So if we're, if we're generating data about cotton industry, the cotton industry that should be used in order to improve the livelihoods and conditions of cotton farmers. Amazing. Well, we are just on time and I don't think I have, I mean, my one call to action would be uh, 
uh, I don't want to sound, uh, sound like I'm spamming you, but uh, the cotton paper has so many research uh, resources, uh, so many, ad so much advice on whether you're a citizen, a brand, an NGO, a researcher on how to tackle this problem and make it better. So I would encourage you to um, download it, skim through it, or read it all. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you want to contact us, I, uh, I think any, uh, you can contact us at communications at transformersfoundation.org. And uh, here it is, the email. Otherwise, I wish everybody a very good Friday and uh, weekend. And thanks so much for our expert to joining, uh, for joining us today. So thank you so much. See you next time. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Thank you.